Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our Saturday uh, Facebook Live that we come to you with every weekend with Sama Dog. We call it Sama Saturdays, well-being for dogs and their humans and have some time to come together and really share the love and connection that we have with our furry companions. My name is Amanda Ree. I'm the founder of Sama Dog and I am so excited today to bring to you a topic that almost on a daily basis, we are talking about at our house with all of either our dogs or all the boarding dogs that come through about how do you get your dog to eat consistently? And some of you, as I joked about in my post about this Facebook Live, some of you might be thinking, my dog never has a problem eating. Actually, they're eating too much, but uh, we maybe you don't have this kind of dog, but there are other people that certainly have a lot of struggles with this. And that, of course, it depends on every dog being an individual, and that's what we'll talk a lot about today. I'm very excited to have this beautiful woman to my side, Dr. Katie Kangas. She is not only a dear friend and my soul sister, but uh, she is one of, more importantly maybe, she is one of San Diego's top integrative or holistic vets, and she has an amazing background, so diverse, so many different areas, and that's one of the first things I'll ask her to share is just in a nutshell, a little bit about her background and what she's been doing. But now she's in San Diego and she is making things happen. Well, she's always been in San Diego, but now she's um, a holistic vet. So after practicing for 25 years as a veterinarian, now for the last 10, an integrative or holistic vet here um, in down, downtown and kind of like a central San Diego and has seen you know so many dogs in this area. Tons of people I speak to are raving about Katie. They cannot uh, say enough about how wonderfully she has helped heal their animals. She's a wealth of knowledge, which you will see once I zip it and <laughs> we'll get into it. And I just want to say thank you very much for all of your love and service. Thank you. And wisdom. Thank you for the gracious introduction. <laughs> and it is my pleasure, my pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah. And my feelings for Amanda and her skills and how she reaches so many pets and so many people are, you know, so, so blessed to to have our connection mm -hmm. and I'm so eager to share more information with anybody who needs to learn some of these things. So thank you for inviting me. Mm, and it's always wonderful, you're welcome, and it's always wonderful to hear from a vet, especially someone that, you know, not only has all that knowledge behind them, but is on the front lines of, you could say, of this conversation. Probably every day she has someone come into her clinic that says, my dog won't eat. We've been talking about these dogs all morning. So we're happy to share them with you. So Dr. Kangas, let's start from just a little nutshell about your background. I love the story of how you came through the shelters and all that too, yeah, and did okay. so many different thank works. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get into food. Okay, so thank you. Um, Amanda mentioned that I've been a vet for actually 25 years, which is pretty amazing that I can say that. Uh, but it's nice because I have such a diverse background that I brought to what I currently do. And I did general medicine and surgery for you know, 15 years, but in there I also did shelter work and actually was the medical director of San Diego Humane Society and SPCA for several years, uh, but also worked with the county shelters in San Diego and a lot of the rescue groups. So rescuing and, you know, shelter uh, work is definitely near and dear to my heart. Uh, but I became interested in holistic medicine in about 2005 because of my own dog, Asti, at the time was 14 and she was struggling with some weakness issues in her hind end and uh, what just ran out of options in Western medicine to really help her uh, much past that. And then I had always been interested in holistic medicine and found a mentor and uh, Dr. Keith Weingart actually, mm -hmm. who helped me treat my dog, Asti, and I saw such tremendous benefits and she, lived to 16 with superb quality of life for another few years. So that inspired me. I had to learn to do this for my patients. And so that's what kind of took me out of full-time shelter medicine and uh, off to acupuncture school and then branched out into herbal. And really my passion now, and I utilize a lot of different things, but food medicine and food therapy and nutritional approaches. And so I do a lot of and approach what is called in human medicine, functional medicine. Mm. And so functional medicine focuses a lot on nutrition, but definitely it's, it's as a, a lot of holistic medicine really getting to the underlying issue that's causing the symptoms 
and um, from a very functional approach rather than just treating symptoms, which is typically oftentimes what Western medicine approach is. Okay. So anyway, that's my passion. I talk a lot about nutrition in my practice, so it's a great topic for us to be talking about today. No matter what a patient comes to me, you know, no matter what problem they're coming to me for, what the you know, pet parent is um, bringing them for, we always talk about nutrition because it always matters yeah. and what they're eating and how they're eating and that sort of thing. So, and as Amanda mentioned, there are certainly a lot of dogs that, you know, their appetite never fails unless they're really, really, you know, having an issue. But there's a lot of doggies too who, and sometimes it's breed tendency and certainly there's a lot of, you know, personality and individual, uh, you know, tendencies. But there are a lot of dogs that just, People struggle to find something that they like or that they'll eat consistently. You have to, you know, rotate and do all kinds of things. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And if those of you saw me looking to the side, not to be rude and uh, distracted from our conversation, but what I have over here to my side is a laptop so that we're able to see your comments coming in. So do let us know that you can hear us and see us okay. Give us a little heart, a little thumbs up, and tell us where you're tuning in from. I'm sure some of you are in the San Diego area, which as mentioned, of course, is where we are, but I know we have followers all around the world, luckily, and so let us know where you're coming in from. It's, it's a great privilege to be able to get this knowledge out to every little corner everywhere because we know and you know that there are many places that don't have access to this kind of wisdom. So just as a side note, so I don't forget to say it later, Dr. Kangas was saying that she does phone consultations. So if any of you are struggling to find a um, integrative vet near you, then she is near you, just a <laughs> phone call away. So let's get yeah. into the food conversation. First, kind of taking it, we're gonna break it up by kind of uh, the physical side, the behavioral and emotional side, and even a little bit into the spiritual side, because that's what Sama Dog and you are all about. And so um, when we get into the physical side of things, you know, what, what is it that you typically hear and what are your first kind of steps to guide people when they just say, okay, I can't get my dog to eat, I'm going crazy here. Well, first I wanna, you know, take a, depth of a history to find out, you know, what's going on, are there health issues, because certainly as a veterinarian, the first thing I'm looking at is physical issues, underlying, you know, health conditions, and that is really common, uh, and oftentimes it's, it's actually a gastrointestinal issue, and, you know, some of you may have heard of the term um, IBD, or irritable bowel disease, or inflammatory bowel disease, and then also leaky gut syndrome, uh, something else that's very common in dogs is actually indigestion, which is also termed dyspepsia or GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. Mm -hmm. So there can be a lot of physical things that can impact a dog's appetite. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you have indigestion, that can make you know a big difference. Mm -hmm. And um, part of that whole uh, dyspepsia or indigestion picture is something that uh, that involves uh, low hydrochloric acid in the stomach, and that's the acid that is there to digest the food. And as people age, honestly, and as dogs age too, we become more deficient in hydrochloric acid, and that will lend to some indigestion type uh, or gastric reflux type issues. And that can really affect the appetite. And so I often ask for the telltale symptoms, but sometimes there are no symptoms. So I often ask, is there any burping, belching, lip smacking, you know, things like that, or gag reflux. A lot of people will say, oh yeah, my dog goes, oh, you yeah. know, a lot of times. That's probably because there's a little bit of acid coming up. Um, but interestingly, Western medicine treats that with antacids, but we actually, that there's acid in the stomach for a reason, and usually when it's coming, it's there to digest the food properly. Usually when it's coming up, it's actually a deficiency of hydrochloric acid. Mm -hmm. So the Western medicine approach it is not so beneficial, especially long-term, because we really wanna nurture the stomach to do its normal processes. So I have natural supplements that, re, you know, and food-based supplements that really correct that imbalance, which is awesome. But one of the interesting things is if your dog does have that, that is one of the most common things that causes a decreased appetite if from a physical standpoint. We're still gonna talk about behavioral and emotional. But oftentimes when I start asking questions for these symptoms, they're there if they're not eating. And um, you know, one of the things that I always think of for dogs that just you know have decreased appetites and don't want to eat is is dyspepsia. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. Uh, it's so interesting, and what I, something you said really hit me, which is food-based medicine. Yes. 
and we were talking about that on Wednesday too. Maybe some of you saw that I was with uh, Lucy Postens, the founder of The Honest Kitchen, and our whole conversation was about food as medicine. And the body, I mean, not to divert us too much because we have it's a perfect. lot to cover and we've got all <laughs> kinds of stuff to show you. So it's a very exciting show today. But, so then we could go on for an hour, but we won't. <laughs> we probably will <laughs> Yeah, really. But um, what is interesting is the way that the body assembles, assimilates, and, is, and utilizes food-based products, food-based supplements versus pharmaceutical or chemicals. Absolutely. So just a little comment In a that. more so natural different. form, it's absolutely yeah. different. And that is why I, you know, I'm, I'm very big on, you know, discussing and promoting food-based supplements mm -hmm. and, you know, nutritional supplements that are from natural ingredients because there's so many synthetic things that do not act in the body obviously the same way and you know even vitamins that are synthetic yeah. definitely don't recommend them and the body cannot utilize them and use them appropriately to you know balance the the body processes so yeah. mm, interesting well, for those of you that are just tuning in with us, my name is Amanda Ree, founder of Sama Dog. This is Dr. Katie Kangas, San Diego's favorite holistic and integrated vet. And she, um, we are talking about how do I get my dog to eat? We're talking about getting, getting that consistent routine of food in their bellies that of course give them the nourishment that they need. Because all this inconsistency with their food is at some level, we'll talk about it, like some level of fasting is actually good, but when it's all the time, back and forth, every couple days, not so good. It's just really unstable and unbalanced. So that's what we're trying to help you guys out with today. Let us know that you're here and definitely um, chime in online with any uh, questions that you may have. We'll talk a little bit about uh, this, you know, this topic and show you some of the products and things like that that we wanna share. But we also definitely wanna answer your questions. And if you enjoy this conversation and you know some others that would enjoy it as well, or you're in a network of a lot of other animal lovers and friends, please share this out there. Just hit that little share button at the bottom. It'll really help us to get the word out. All right, so let's dive into it. What, um, where would you like to go next with it? Uh, the, how, can, so how do you, what, what do you say? You know, how do you get them to eat? Okay, so once we, you know, kind of cover a lot of the history questions about, you know, physical issues that might be going on, mm -hmm. um, doing a physical exam and, and potentially, um, you know, revealing any issues that we need to address there, then we can move on to asking questions about what's going on behaviorally with emotional stressors and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, differences with behaviorals, you know, breed tendencies actually, mm -hmm. you know, small, as a general rule, small breed dogs, um, well, everybody knows labs are just great eaters, you know, that kind of dog. Um, a lot of working breeds and herding breeds, you know, they may be a little more iffy with uh, mm -hmm. having great appetites too. I think they're, you know, they're I've so focused that. on working and, you know, doing that they might not be as food motivated as some other breeds. Yeah. A lot of smaller breeds or breeds that just have, you know, kind of high energy, kind of high anxiety as it would, you know, kind of make sense, mm -hmm. uh, may be dogs that would have more of a tendency to have you know, issues with appetite. So that's definitely um, a factor as well. And then the other thing that I have found in the years of doing veterinary medicine period, but definitely since I've been more integrative and holistic in doing a lot of you know, food medicine, is that there are a good number of dogs that actually have a time of the day preference with eating too. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of dogs that much prefer to eat their, their meal later in the day and they're really thrilled about dinner and they're not so thrilled about breakfast mm -hmm. and they may want to skip breakfast. And I have numerous people tell me that their dogs will skip breakfast a lot or intermittently eat breakfast and dinner they're diving in. Mm -hmm. So that can be in, you know, a big factor too. And then one of the things that I ask uh, pet owners, pet parents about a lot also is how many meals a day are you feeding? Most people, you know, as the general rule, twice a day is kind of the, you know, the typical, uh, you know, meal frequency that most people do. But there are a lot of people that feed their doggies multiple times a day. And, you know, people four, five, six times a day. Wow. And that's, that's, you know, unless, you know, sometimes the, the pet has had such issues with digestive problems and, you know, working through, you know, illness issues with inflammatory bowel and stuff like that. So I don't want to jump in and rock the boat right away if they've really, you know, worked it out to where this is, this is the way that that particular dog does best. But mm -hmm. as a general rule, that's feeding too frequent. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
naturally evolutionarily in the wild you know wolves and and wild canine you know relatives uh, would not be eating that many times a day and um, it makes really good sense for not only dogs but also humans to give the digestive tract and the body some rest from digestion and that's that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of information for people and now also coming out for dogs about intermittent fasting mm -hmm. intermittent fasting when you give the digestive tract and the body a break from food then those same processes yeah the, di the enzymes that help with digestion your, di your digestive enzymes are actually when there's no food to be working on they are also enzymes that work on detoxification. Mm -hmm. So they're helping and, and anti-inflammatory processes. So Which when your huge, dog huge or yourself- inflammation problems. Exactly. Our and all of our animals. Exactly. All disease is inflammation. All health problems have inflammation at the core level. Mm -hmm. So when you talk inflammation or chronic inflammation, you can check off every single disease with that. So <laughs> this is just such a great comprehensive topic because it affects everything. And so when you give the digestive tract and the stomach some rest, the body's actually much better at turning on its own anti-inflammatory you know, pathways and cleanup mechanisms and detoxification me mechanisms to keep the body in a healthier state and a tip-top thriving state. So number of meals, very important. So I definitely, as long as it doesn't, um, you know, cause a particular problem for the pet. I, you know, really try and counsel people to maybe back off on the number of meals if they're doing it too much. One of the other interesting things too that I can add in is oftentimes when people tell me that, boy, I'm having such trouble getting my doggy to eat and, you know, hit or miss, some days are good, you know, some days are, are not, um, or it's a general consistent thing where, where they don't wanna eat their meals, but yet, when I'm evaluating the patient, they're not underweight. Mm. You know, they're not, maybe not even thin, not even lean. Um, and so sometimes I think it's a, it's a um, little bit of a um, I don't, disconnect or whatever be, for a lot of pet parents that the meal goes down and maybe the dog's not enthused with the meal, but perhaps that could be because they're getting so many snacks and other you know foods throughout the day that the meal's not so exciting especially when snacks tend to be more kind of you know high commodity foods and things that are really tasty and so if they're eating multiple meals or snacks all day long then maybe the the actual you know balanced diet meal that's going in the dish is not as appealing and they're like well i don't need to eat that i'm eating snacks six times a day yeah so that's like another humans. right so that's Seems another thing right. too is um you know uh being a little cognizant about snacks versus meals and then we can mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about how we can make the meals more appealing mm -hmm. and more appetizing as well between different types of foods that you're feeding and then also other fantastic medicinal foods and power foods that you can add to their meals and their dish that will not only make them more excited about eating mm -hmm. but really profoundly impact their health in a good way yeah. so that is the dog's favorite part of this conversation. Yes. <laughs> They're like, okay, enough of this. Don't give me more snacks. Right. <laughs> Don't listen to her mom. Right. But that, that part, part, okay, yeah. That part's good. That part's good. And not that snacks are bad. So we can, you know, just in excess and yeah. in frequency, that can definitely impact how you know they're going to um, be attracted to their meal and then the other thing you know to point out with that is as long as they're you know high quality snacks and they're you know not have carb and not you know soy release. and wheat and yeah and heavily processed stuff um, but even if they're high quality treats which is of course all we you know what would want to do um, they're still not balanced Okay, they're dried meat, that's great. Dehydrated air dried meats, that's what I use in my practice for treats. Mm -hmm. And my patients love me, they would love me anyway, but they yes, love they me do. extra, extra because yeah. I give out a lot of treats, which is awesome. They see the doors of your office and they yeah. don't want to run like they do in other offices. <laughs> exactly, so, uh, so we love that, but just keep in mind, even though they're high quality treats, mm -hmm. they're not balanced. And so it is important to make sure that we have a balanced you know, meal time mm -hmm. that is going to be accepted and, you know, ingested so that they're getting the nutrients that they need in, you know, a, a balanced and complete way. One question that comes to mind that I know a lot of people um, have conversations around is leaving the food out. 
So you put the food down 9 a.m. or 7 a.m. or whatever time you're trying to feed breakfast, and then the food just stays down through the day, and that's how they feed. It open feeding, right, is what it's called. Or yeah, free feeding, feeding, free feeding, free feeding. So what are your thoughts on it? Well, um, you know, free feeding is usually done with dry food, <laughs> with kibble. Um, and yeah, because otherwise you get ants and all kinds of weird right, things, right? So, and, you know, as a, a integrative holistic vet who's very passionate, you know, anybody in, in my field of what we do, we're all passionate about nutrition because, you know, nutrition is the foundation of, of health and, yeah. you know, food is the most important medicine that you can put in your body every day. So, um, you know, that is, um, remind me, what's your question? The free feeding? Oh yeah, the free feeding, thank you. So, um, leaving the food down with dry food, you know, some dogs, a, lo a lot of dogs obviously like Labradors and stuff like that, you can't do that because they'll <laughs> overeat. Um, but, you know, some breeds that don't tend to be overeaters, that may work okay. But as I was saying, as a, as a holistic vet, my one, you know, big encouragement for people when we talk about nutrition is to transition their pet to a diet that's not kibble and not heavily processed and not dry. And oftentimes, I mean, it's great that you brought that up. Oftentimes when people tell me, oh, we just leave the food out and they don't, you know, they don't overeat. And I said, well, if we change their diet to something that is really nutrient dense and, you know, less processed and, and much, not only much healthier for them, but much tastier, then you're, that's not gonna be the case, yeah. and that's rarely the case. So if you're feeding something like raw food, or a home-cooked diet, or you know partially that, uh, freeze-dried diets, dehydrated diets, the vast majority of the time, the pet, the dog's just gonna you know, eat it right up, yeah. so. And it's, it's a good, good gauge, right, to know like if your dog like dives in, like they're so excited, they can't wait for you to put the bowl down, they dive in and rawr, scarf it down, I mean safely, hopefully not too inhaled, but eat it, eat it well and enjoy it, like that's the goal, right? That's how you know that you're onto a good formulation for your pup. Exactly. I mean, that, that's so natural and that's what we're looking for. And then, you know, the, the body is thriving mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the reasons why I think as a lot of pets age or as they start having health problems or health mm -hmm. conditions, their zest for eating heavily processed food and dry food starts to decline. Yeah. And so that's one of the things, you know, obviously with looking for physical problems is that if people tell me their dog's not so excited about eating dry food anymore, oftentimes it's because their body is telling them that that is not enough nutrition for them. That is not gonna mm -hmm. sustain their health to the level that they need. And oftentimes when you know they're young and they don't have a lot of health issues, it's not as big. Like kids, we ate Captain it's, Crunch and we're exactly. like, this is delicious. Right, it's not, not as big of an issue, but as the body ages or starts to you know face some health issues, then the body is inherently naturally saying, yeah. that is not gonna sustain me and I'm looking for something that is gonna be more nutritious, so yeah. We have a couple questions from our wonderful audience. So let's see, let's just say hello to some of you. Mary Lee, great to see you here with us. Susan, Donna, um, well, let's take a question here. I can't seem to scroll quite well. <laughs> so Susan is uh, saying, uh, so seeing about bully sticks made from grass-fed cattle, are those okay? They uh, love, love them, and um, is it like all natural beef jerky? Uh, so bully sticks. Right. So, it, you know, if it is grass fed and obviously it's, you know, bovine derived, um, okay for a food source. But the one thing to be aware of is I also have a big uh, background with den dental knowledge and dentistry. Mm -hmm. And I talk, mm -hmm. I, you know, present and, and teach a lot on uh, dental health and oral health. And so, one of the things that I find with bully sticks and things that are long, you know, long, thin, and hard is that they can be culprits to break teeth. And broken mm. teeth are definitely an issue we want to avoid. Uh, with if oftentimes, if the tooth breaks, the root canal is exposed. Mm. Okay, and so that can lead to infection and tooth abscess and things like that. So you do want to be careful. The rule of thumb amongst veterinary dental experts is really if you can't bend the object. Uh, with your hands or you can't dent it with a fingernail, it's hard enough to break a tooth. Mm. So some of the things that so like I see- antlers. That's, thank you, that was just gonna say, some of the things mm -hmm. I see that cause an issue are antlers, hooves, and sometimes bully sticks. Uh -huh. uh, so just be aware of that. 
Now, raw meaty bones, which is something that we really like to uh, talk about to promote dental health um, and good nutrition at the same time, um, for pets that are on a raw food diet, or even if maybe they're not eating a raw food diet all the time, as you know, a food item, either a snack or just you know an intermittent item, feeding them raw chicken and turkey necks is great because raw bones grind you know as you chew them they're not going to splinter like a cooked bone so they're very safe and actually because the neck is you know part of the body the chicken neck is meaty we call it a raw meaty bone the mm -hmm. teeth can sink into that actually rubs up on the gums and creates more active uh you know plaque and tartar removal than a lot of other chew items mm -hmm. so and interestingly talking That's about nice. the bully stick and the long thin items big knuckle bones and big marrow bones when they even though those are hard Mm -hmm. Because they're large, the angle and force of the jaw when the when the doggy's chewing on it is actually a lot different than when it's uh, long and thin. That's when they get more force on it, and it's more likely to break a tooth. Mm -hmm. So bigger bones are actually typically safer with uh, not being as much of a risk for dental damage. Mm -hmm. And it's the natural way, right? And dogs were absolutely again back to their ancestors. They were cleaning their teeth, not with their parents brushing them but right. with bones with right. gnawing yep sometimes our dogs will even get a stick like not a, you know sometimes the tiny ones are a mess and i don't want them to digest that necessarily but they'll get like a bigger piece of wood and kind of just gnaw on the corner i wonder sometimes is that okay and i feel like is that a natural desire to want to clean the teeth a little bit it may, well part of it may be a natural desire and part of it may just be you know boredom Funny, activity boredom. you know doing that yeah. yeah so a bit of a risk I mean a lot of dogs obviously the most because so many dogs do that most yeah. probably get away with that just fine the vast majority of the time but you know we do Splinter. see splinters mm -hmm. um, you know puncture the gums or the you know oral tissues yeah. um, and if they ingest them I mean it is yeah. possible to get uh, you know a perforation of the esophagus or the mm -hmm. gut and potentially end up with big problems and you know surgical uh, problems that you know need to go in surgically to correct so yeah. so definitely a, a bit of a risk so I try yeah. to discourage that and give them um, you know safe chew things yeah. so things like Kong toys and hard rubber toys and I love things that you can stuff treats mm -hmm. in um, really gives it because mental enrichment environmental enrichment and physical you know things for dogs to do is so important for mm -hmm. their overall well-being not just their physical health but their mental and emotional health mm -hmm. so yeah so let's move into that mental emotional behavioral what are some of the influencing factors when it comes to food there yeah, yeah such a great you know we talked about personality and breed tendencies um, and then the other thing is environmental stressors as well and so, you know, it may depend on the room that, you know, you're feeding your dog in, mm -hmm. where you're putting their dish. Is there a lot of commotion going on in the house there? Maybe, you know, even what's going on with you mm -hmm. as you're feeding your pet. Are you rushing around and stressed? Are you, you know, heading out the door to work? Is your dog really bonded to you? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of dogs that are more what we call social eaters and cats too honestly, um, where they are more apt to eat when they're with their people or, mm -hmm. you know, other, maybe even other yeah. animals if they're bonded to other animals. And so if you're heading out, the, a lot of pets won't eat when they're, when they're, you know, pet parents aren't with them. Right. Or if you're busy and rushed and you're stressed, then our pets obviously they're feel stressed. our energy yeah. big time. And a lot of people are beginning to realize that more and more. But I think historically we didn't really realize how much our emotional state of being and and our uh, you know vibes that we're putting out we a lot of times it's subconscious to us we don't realize what we're doing but our pets feel that mm -hmm. they sense that and that can make a big impact for them so with the room that you're feeding them in um, you know what's going on around them in the environment is it noisy is it next to a door or a window where there's outdoor distractions um, and then what's going on with you and your timing and you know you physically and emotionally and then perhaps the other thing in the environment would be other pets as well so what's going on with other dogs there's of course a lot of people have multi-dog households and um, you know several doggy kids getting meals at the same time and you know pretty much everybody knows there's sort of a pack order where you know you kind of have your top dog and maybe your dogs that are more submissive and the personality you know differences in there and so if you're feeding them right next to each other perhaps the dog that's more submissive 
might not feel comfortable eating next to them or you know other dogs want to guard their food and they're already ready they eat so fast and they're ready to pounce on the other dog's dish so think of all these different environmental dynamics that are going on between you know noises and places what's going on with you and what's going on with other pets and those can all be adjusted once you kind of get some awareness about it you can start making some adjustments to improve things mm -hmm. We have a question from Heather, and it, she says, is surgical tooth extraction, it's back to the teeth conversation, <laughs> is, surgical, <laughs> topics. <laughs> is surgical tooth extraction usually recommended for a broken tooth, or is there another form of treatment? Uh, actually, it depends. If the root canal is exposed, okay, so if, the, if, the, if it's just like a crack off the very tip of the tooth and the root canal is not exposed, then actually something can be done called a bonded sealant, where you literally seal over uh, so that the layer between the enamel, which is the outside layer, which doesn't have any nerve endings and feelings, but the, the inner, you know, the most inner part of the tooth is the root canal, and then the layer in between is called the dentin, but there's actually nerve endings in there, and the dentin is sensitive, and if you ever know that, you know, when you get sensitive, uh, sensitivity to your teeth, mm. Uh, with cold or hot or brushing or something like that is probably because you have some worn enamel and you got a little dentin exposure And so when it breaks through that first layer of enamel and the dentin it's sensitive And so you don't want to leave that because that does that does hurt. It's not comfortable and eventually it can lead to root canal um, Infection or mm -hmm. abscess, but back to your question if the root canal is exposed you absolutely need either one of two things you either need surgical um, extraction of the tooth or root canal procedure mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you don't want to leave that root canal open because it leaves them open to infection and it's a constant source of inflammation and bacteria getting into the bloodstream yeah. all day long. Mm -hmm. Not to mention it hurts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It hurts them, influences their eating desire. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the entry to digestion. Sometimes we focus, focus on the stomach and even the colon and that whole process, but we forget that this is the beginning yes. right here. I'm and, so glad and, you said that. And it's very much that way for yeah. our dogs. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, we started uh, the physical part of the conversation about um, dyspepsia and, and GERD and um, indigestion and kind of just what Amanda said is, is what I put into words all the time too is a lot of times, you know, in conventional medicine when you hear that there's a, you know, gut sensitivity or, you know, appetite problems or even stool problems, a lot of doctors and people are thinking about the lower gut, you know, down in here and, you know, the intestines and the colon. And a lot of people forget about the, yeah. you know, the mouth and the upper GI, the esophagus and the, and the gastric environment or stomach environment is where everything starts. Mm -hmm. And so if this isn't functioning properly, then the rest can't function yeah. properly. It's so one digestion system. starts there. Yeah. It's one system. Yep. And it's all connected. It. Yeah, it's all connected. <laughs> Just like the whole body's connected, <laughs> which is, of course, what we're all about with holistic whole body medicine. So. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love Yay. it. See, you can see why we want to make this a three hour long Facebook <laughs> So let's get into some of these great things that we have okay, around awesome. us. And then we'll get back into some of our yeah. other things. But I think it's it's time. Yes. So what do you think? When it comes to you know making dog food more delicious, yes. that is clearly, whether it's humans or dogs, right? Right. Really. Uh, that is clearly the way to stoke the appetite. Yeah. So what do you kind of, go, what's your first go-tos and how do you recommend it? So the neat thing is, is that that we can make it more delicious and more nutritious at the same time. Delicious and nutritious. It's like win-win. And all this so, fresh stuff, I'm sorry to interrupt exactly, you, but all no, this fresh perfect. stuff that we're going to add is fresh food that's prana, that's life force, that's, that's bringing vitality to them. Right. Just like we keep saying, right, if we just ate Cheerios the rest of our lives, right. there's no life force in that and therefore none of us can thrive. And exactly. our dogs are exactly the same. Exactly. So yeah, heavily processed food, you know, most people intuitively get the fact that the more you heat a food and that's mm -hmm. what you know dry kibble is heavily heated at high temperatures yeah. and then pressurized so heavily processed food you know kind of a no-brainer it's going to be less nutritious the more heat the less nutrient bioavailability at the end and, and the less uh you know vitality of the nutrients but also one of the things that a lot of people don't know is when food is more heavily processed or heated that it also promotes inflammation in the body too and we talked about inflammation before and so that's you know really an important fact is that you know if we went to a human nutritionist the first two things they would tell us is less processed food in your life mm -hmm. and less sugar in your life and one of the reasons why processed food is 
not good is one is it's less nutritious, but two is it promotes inflammation more. So the fresher, more delicious and more nutritious food is going to be more of an anti-inflammatory diet, which means, you know, overall health because all all disease inflammation as we you know as we mentioned so yeah yeah good okay so where would you like to start you so to, what about like maybe start with like the base foods yeah so one of the things that I really like to encourage people to do is of course to transition their dog if possible off of a dry food diet mm -hmm. and you know I always recommend to do things slow and not to feel rushed and not to run home and make you know immediate changes overnight so <laughs> the next you know, meal is completely different exactly. people do do that I talk so, with them too and it's like know, that dog can't even identify that food because they've never seen anything like it exactly so, so you can do do things slow don't feel like you have to be rushed but my goal is always to transition you know away from dry food if possible or at least partly possible and you know some of this is budget you know everybody's working on a budget and that's a you know a fact of life and you know I always kind of chuckle with my you know clients that are pet parents of small dogs because I'm like score you know they're more cost effective you can <laughs> afford to feed little dogs you know high quality food much easier than if you have three 80 pound dogs yeah. it becomes very difficult so i you know always suggest to people just do the best you can for your budget and if that means you know that you're topping the food with you know good things like we're going to talk about or you know one meal a day is you know fresher food and one meal a day is you know the more processed food things like that but I, I always you know talk about mixing and matching. I mean, a lot of people think that the diet has to be 100% a type of format, like it has to be all dry or all dehydrated or all home cooked. Mm -hmm. um, and you can mix and match. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's often a very good thing. And honestly, you know, people have been very misinformed, unfortunately, by vets for years that eating the exact same thing all the time is such a benefit. And honestly, that's not true. Uh, actually, the more variety and the more rotation through the diet is going to promote more health and you know more balance. Because mm -hmm. obviously, if we ate the exact same meal every single day, mm -hmm. you know that is not going to give us as much of a comprehensive nutrient mm -hmm. you know picture as if you're getting some variety in the diet. So we do want to work on variety. And for doggies that have been so used to the exact same thing, you know, for years maybe on end or months on end. Um, you definitely want to be a little bit more cognizant of going, you know, a little slower with transition so you don't cause that digestive upset and end up having a little bit of a setback as you're making your changes. So, but with, uh, with moving away from dry food, there's lots of options. Yeah. Honestly, interestingly, I used to counsel people a lot and encourage to do home cooked diets. When I started doing holistic veterinary medicine, uh, and integrative medicine about a decade ago, uh, I used to really talk a lot about home cooking and giving people recipes and stuff like that. Interestingly, I've kind of uh, evolved away from that to recommending, you know, maybe adding some simple home cooked items to really amp up some of the uh, nutrition in the diet and the, and the tastiness and, and uh, uh, delicious part of it. But um, because it's very difficult to make a well-balanced diet when you do the entire thing yourself mm -hmm. um, and so there are a lot of people that spend a lot of time and effort mm -hmm. to do a home-cooked diet and and they're just not you know they're just not able to meet the nutritional needs and the pet ends up with a deficient diet mm -hmm. so and then the other thing is there's a lot more stuff on the market now that is truly good stuff that did not exist five and ten years ago or even two years ago uh -huh. and some of those things we're going to be you know talking about today so there's a lot more options that are not dry food now with freeze-dried foods dehydrated foods air-dried foods mm -hmm. and all these other things mm -hmm. that were not so easily accessible before so so let's show them the, the ones you just mentioned yeah many of them um let me see if because we can't see the screen from there so i'm going to just make sure we can see these things. oh, oh yeah, here we go here we see. go good job good job <laughs> nice yay so there's me looking for it yeah so i'll do a little bit of show and tell yeah. so some of the things that i really like to show people are freeze-dried diets okay so this is one of the options that is definitely a much better alternative to uh, dry food, and I don't know if yeah, I'll bring it up close. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Very so interesting. That the happens to be like the small brunch brand, but there's Primal, Stella and Chewy's, uh, Northwest Naturals. Yeah, there's lots of different options for freeze dried out there these days. Canine Naturals, and you can see, you know, the texture too. If I stand up there, mm -hmm. can you see? Yep. 
Yeah, you're good. Okay, so the texture is this dried flaky texture. So it is dry, but the thing is there's never been any heating involved uh, with ah. the processing of freeze dried. So they actually take the raw ingredients, and by the way, these are fully balanced. They look like treats. Yeah. They can actually be used as treats. Well, dogs but love this them. Is a complete and balanced diet, and I'm telling you, when you read the ingredients on these high quality freeze dried diets, you're yeah. going to be impressed. Yeah. They're fantastic. Turkey, you know, turkey necks, turkey back, turkey liver, quality. turkey hearts, turkey gizzards, turkey yep. or no, squat, organic so, tons of things, yes. cauliflower, beans, meat and bok bone choy, and organ meat, apple cider vinegar, bee pollen, yeah. cilantro. Yeah, and so much these are actually fully balanced diets even though they look like treats. Huh. They're also fantastic for on the go. I mean, this is one of the best travel diets. Yeah. Um, the reason this is such a good choice is because, you know, we didn't actually talk about full raw yet, frozen mm. fresh raw, which we can, but raw diets, you know, for the, you know, I always tell people there's no one right diet for every individual. So when people ask me about raw diets, in general, that's what I favor for most pets. Um, a lot of dogs will dive right into raw the first time loving it and then mm -hmm. some pets may not like it or it may take a little bit of introduction time to transition. Most dogs will dive right into freeze dried. Mm -hmm. And the thing with freeze dried is all, you know, like I said, they just remove the moisture and freeze it. So there's act, absolutely no heating involved, which means the nutrients are really vital and really bioavailable. So awesome. this makes that such a Here's nice another choice. brand just so you guys see it, uh, yeah. Primal. Okay. So, so these could be used, by the way, as a full meal, or they could be used as toppers. Crack, crack, so yeah, so if you're it. still doing a, a dry food diet or a kibble diet, or if you're choosing one of the other options like dehydrated, or you're doing some home cooked or other options, the um, freeze dried can be a topper or a mix in. I just want to say one thing, which is buying where to buy your dog's food or your cat's food or any of your animal's foods is from a natural local pet food store. Yes. Not the big box stores. It's not that everything in there is so terrible, but the education of the staff, the knowledge of the products, the understanding of holistic nutrition is not there in nearly the same way that it is in a local natural it's pet market, so like true. independently owned, yep. like boutique stores. They've got it. So they've got all this stuff and, and more and can give you great guidance. Absolutely. And I tell people the same thing when they ask me where to go. Go to the smaller specialty stores uh, because the bigger stores honestly don't have a lot of the same you know, products there and, and you know, get the education too. And then the other thing I really love to do is promote a lot of the local companies mm -hmm. that do, you know, not only the local awesome pet stores, but also the local raw food. Uh, like Small Batch, makers. that's Sandy, uh, that's California, right? Yeah, yeah and that's they do Small Batch, yep. And uh -huh. then we can talk about some of the other local companies yeah. too that do raw foods here as well. Yeah. So, okay, then we wanted to mention with the dehydrated... Speaking of local. Yeah, <laughs> speaking of local, exactly. And, and we Lucy have, uh, from Wednesday, as I mentioned, we yeah. have a whole long uh, conversation about it. So if anyone's interested in that, just jump back on the Sama Dog page a couple days and you'll see a great Facebook Live about that. But this is what this is all about and what it yeah. looks like. So another option, so as opposed to freeze-dried, this is dehydrated, so processed a little bit differently. Um, the meat portion in here is low temperature cooked, and so, you know, the nice thing is you don't have to worry about, you know, contaminants and things like that when people have potentially in a re reservations about a raw food diet. Uh -huh. um, and uh, this comes in like a, a chunky powder Perform. form. And you reconstitute like it. White. Yeah, <laughs> you reconstitute it with water. You can use broth. Same thing with the freeze dried. By the way, you can make that wet. You know, you can moisten that with broth or water. Uh, with the dehydrated diets, you definitely want to do that. This this freeze dried could go either way. Um, Honest Kitchen. You know, other uh, brands that are very similar to Honest Kitchen. Same type of of uh, processing and same type of texture mm -hmm. are awesome options too to uh, switch away from dry food. And um, these are very palatable. Most dogs really like them. Uh, the texture is a little bit, you know, soft and mushy when you make it, but you can tailor the amount of water that goes in. Mix for, it in, always yep, like you mix it in. It's a good way. And then, you know, if you're mixing, uh, transitioning, or even if the diet is still half kibble, mm -hmm. this is a great mix-in diet or a standalone diet. That's something that I've been asked several times. It's okay to mix it in with kibble, like the way the body digests or breaks down food is still suitable. Yeah, and yeah. actually great question because years ago a lot of people felt, a lot of veterinarians even felt that mixing full raw diets, you know, fresh frozen raw that uh -huh. you thaw and feed, that mixing that with kibble, dry food in the same meal 
may not be such a good idea because they do digest very differently. Uh -huh. And you know, raw meat should move through the digestive tract a lot faster or moist food should, and then dry food can take a little longer. So people used to think that that might be an issue to feed them at the same time. But honestly, over the years of you know more and more of these types of diets being fed, that mm -hmm. has not been seen to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So most holistic veterinarians and you know food okay. therapy uh, you know experts are saying, really, we have not seen a problem with mixing anything. Right. So you should be able to you know mix and match to your budget and to what your dog likes uh, for either flavors or textures. I love it. Yeah. Okay. What else? So now I think that kind of covers our bases, like the base of <laughs> right. So those the are base fully of balanced the meals because you want the base of the yeah. meal, like Amanda said, to be something that is fully balanced. So, yes. so that's going to have the array of different types of nutrients. And something I didn't talk about, and I know I'm probably going over, but so much to talk about is um, when you're doing a home cooked diet, or, or you know, when we're talking about balanced diets, a lot of people think of muscle meat as the protein, mm -hmm. but organ meat is mm -hmm. really important. And so when people home cook a diet for their pets, they oftentimes are, are feeding a very deficient diet for numbers of reasons. But one of the reasons is because typically people don't provide organ meat. Yeah. And that's what's gonna be in these balanced diets, but also an array of other nutrients and, and you know the vitamins and minerals and things that come from those foods that would be void in diets that are very limited so mm -hmm. that is important Good. but then we can talk about the you know toppers or other food additives that you can put in that can profoundly impact not only their overall health but the deliciousness of the meal so. and the joy that they feel exactly it. it's so it's fun so to watch your dog fun. chow down their delicious meal that you just took maybe 10 more minutes or five more minutes to prepare than you used to but the joy the the satisfaction the, right. the excitement that you see in their eyes as they're waiting like i think for all of us that's a very rewarding part of the process absolutely and the neat thing is is that most of these things don't take hardly any time yeah. at all yeah. and that's the great thing about you know uh, kind of counseling people to maybe not spend so much time and effort home cooking getting yeah. some of these fantastic readily available balanced meals that are good quality and then you get to enhance it with easy things from your kitchen that make you feel more involved in your dog's food which is emotionally also a nice piece too for yourself and the dog, yeah, the dog and and enhance health because you're doing something very very fresh awesome. and so some of these things and I call these medicinal foods oftentimes I call them power foods mm -hmm. uh, like I said even if they're just even if your pet's still eating dry kibble adding these foods to their dish on a regular basis will profoundly impact their health, mm -hmm. uh, as well as their uh, zest for eating their meals. So some of the things we can talk about is sardines, very medicinal food, omega-3 fatty acids are you know uh, very concentrated in oily fish, and most people know omega-3 fatty acids are so valuable for health, they're anti-inflammatory. So mm -hmm. they're, they're you know good for everything, but they're known to be good for joints and heart and brain and kidneys and skin and hair coat and all that kind of stuff. And so I like so, sardines. Yeah, and it's so much better to get it from, again, from the food source, yeah. using food as medicine rather than the supplement. Yes, there's fish oils in a supplement but that people you know squirt on their food, but to give them this, at least in between those times, is a, is a much more direct and healthy source. Absolutely, I love to go straight to the food source yeah. when possible. So I'd rather feed a nutritional or medicinal food than to recommend to buy a product. Yeah. And honestly, most of it, you have to be very choosy with fish oils. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of most fish oils on the market, I hate to say, is not worth taking um, really? at all, yes. Mm -hmm. And for more, humans too? For humans too. Mm -hmm. And more and more nutritional uh, experts are saying to go straight to the food source when you can. Um, most of the fish oil products on the market, uh, there's a lot of mercury and contaminants in fish these days, so the fish have to be from a very good source. Yeah. And then how the fish oil is processed and handled is very important. It needs to be cold processed. Fish oils oxidize and become rancid very easily. That's why you don't want to get dry food that has added fish oils or that's salmon or fatty fish based because those go rancid very quickly after you open the bag. Ah. And they're actually more damaging to the health than that. helpful. Huh. So going straight to the food source provides an enormous benefit in that it's fresher and it's actually safer. Mm. So, and then the neat thing about sardines and, and anchovies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Sardines and anchovies are smaller fish, and a lot of the um, health experts for us are saying, you know, try to eat fish smaller than your dinner plate because, you know, tuna are caught typically as enormous fish. Well, the longer the fish has been alive in the ocean and the higher up it is on the food chain, the more mercury and contaminants you have. Sardines and anchovies are itty bitty fish, feeder mm -hmm. fish, and they're very minimal to no contamination. And they're cheaper. Yeah. So how great is that, that your pet can get a yummy, you know, uh, cost effective and very fresh source of omega-3 that's not contaminated, that's not oxidized, mm. it's perfect. So, one one sardine per meal, is that too much? You know, that's a great question. Uh, you can, with the addition of any new item, go a little bit, you know, slow, uh, slower if your pet has a history of being sensitive to new things. Um, for small dogs, one sardine a day would be enough, okay. or maybe even every other day. Okay. If they're itty bitty, maybe even half a sardine, okay. you know. Um, but for a larger dog, you know, two sardines a day or a big dog, you know, you could even do, there's usually four in a can. You could do a can every other day for a big dog. Um, you know, some people prefer not to have an open can of sardines in the fridge. So, you know, you can, if you have multiple dogs, it's easy. Um, or you can take them out and put them in little individual baggies. Or if you have a big dog, they could do a whole can. So okay. yeah, good to know. Uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Keith Weingart. Uh, who I started doing holistic medicine with, his uh, one of his coined phrases was, a sardine a day keeps the vet away. <laughs> wow. I know. It's I pretty cool. It. Yeah. So, okay. So what else do we have here? This is a great brand. Yes. So maker to talk local, about. Yep. Another yes. local company, <laughs> Soli Raw. Uh, we carry a lot of their treats at, at my practice at Integrated Veterinary Care, as well as they actually make a very high quality bone broth uh, on site there at, the, at their store. And um, they actually have beef version, pork version, duck, uh, turkey. So we have numerous available. This is frozen. It's making my hand cold. Um, and uh, once you thought, it should be used up in about seven days. But bone broth is an absolute healing potion. So I recommend bone broth for everybody, actually, dog and human. Um, and on a daily basis, best. Uh, bone broth has turned into my favorite joint supplement. I would much encourage, uh, much more encourage people to spend your money on bone broth than to buy a glucosamine chondroitin supplement. So Susan, Susan asked a question um, about joint health and CBDs and things, but maybe this is a better direction Oh, bone broth to is amazing. And we are going to be, I'm going to, uh, Amanda and I are going to be doing a webinar coming up on actually more details about all these foods. So look for that coming up because I will go into all the detailed health benefits mm. of bone broth and honestly all these foods that we're talking about. Mm. Um, and and it, it's quite a bit of incredibly useful information. So definitely stay tuned into that. Not only for your dogs, but for us too. All Absolutely. Of, this, of course, if you're vegetarian, some of this will vary. Um, or if you're vegan, clearly that'll be a little bit different. But in the same way that the health is yep. for our animals, yep. it is for us. This, this digestive system is is so similar. Yes, it's so similar. So yeah, it's fun to learn about you know our nutrition and their nutrition at the same time yeah. because it is so similar. <laughs> but just know that bone broth is fantastic for joints. Somebody was asking about joints, but it's also good for so many other things, including you know gut health, skin health, mm. uh, brain health. So we'll go into all those details. It's pretty fantastic stuff, which is why I call it a healing potion. Uh, raw milk, preferably goat milk, but even raw cow milk is a fantastic nutritious uh, item. And uh, when it's raw and not pasteurized and not heated, and again, we can go into a lot of the health benefits of that uh, in our next uh, series coming up, but that's something that can be added. Uh, go, go slow with the addition of new things like we talked about, uh, but that is readily available at the small specialty pet stores different brands like Answers. Answers is a phenomenal company. Oh, I love that. Um, so they are just excellent quality. They've really cornered the market well with fermented foods as well. So they have fermented raw milk, fermented goat cheese, mm -hmm. fermented fish stock, and their goat cheese fish. is just fish. so fish. wonderful. Uh, it is raw. So it's providing a lot of great nutrients, you know, in that. raw dairy. Yeah, it looks like blue cheese. I know, because it's the spirulina one, so it's really uh -huh. funny. And they have a turmeric uh, version like and cheese. also a uh, ginger version. That? So another medicinal food that can be a topper or a treat, uh, readily available and phenomenal quality. So I'm getting more and more into recommending fermented foods. 
uh, for a lot of reasons, and we can cover that in our next series as well. And then, and then one of my other thing. favorite superfoods, too, is coconut oil. So um, unfortunately, there's been some uh, media uh, controversial stuff coming out about yeah, coconut oil. And, and, and yeah, so unfortunately, there's a lot of faulty research uh, that keeps getting you know requoted and repopulated. Um, on coconut oil. It is a saturated fat. It's medium chain triglyceride fat though, MCT. And that there's so many health properties to medium chain triglyceride fat in coconut oil. We'll go into this in more detail in our webinar coming up, but just know that this is one of the foods that I recommend that you give to your pet every day. The nice thing to know about coconut oil um, and fats in general, by the way, we all bought into the low fat craze in the 80s and the 90s, which Everybody got afraid of fat for themselves and for their pets. There's a definite difference between poor quality fats and high quality fats. And these are things that are high quality fats. And again, we'll go into more detail in our, in our next series. But um, don't be afraid of fat. They've actually shown in human studies that you get better weight management when you eat coconut oil and similar healthy fats, that you can actually lose weight and maintain weight better. So don't be afraid of that. The other thing that's nice to know about coconut oil in particular is that it's very easy to digest. So even pets with issues uh, in you know their past with pancreas or um, you know gallbladder issues or something like that, uh, coconut oil is not difficult to digest like some other fats. Okay. Very good to know. That's so, the common question that yes. comes up when there's some sort of perfect indication of avoiding fat. Yes, there's yeah. a mayday, mayday. This is one of the best fats oil. to start with if right. you have a pet that has a history of being sensitive to fat. Mm. But always go slow. If uh, my, my rule of thumb is up to one teaspoon per 10 pounds mm -hmm. of body weight okay. uh, per day, uh, but start with half that or even a quarter of that mm -hmm. and work your way up. If you start at the full top end, you might get soft stools or diarrhea. So, okay. And then another yes. power food, which yeah. you know we can cover again in more detail uh, in our next series, but eggs is another thing that you can put in the food that is so nutritious when it's pasture raised or free range. And know the difference between cage free and pasture raised or free range. Okay, so cage free, they can still all. All the chickens are crammed under one roof, even though they're not in a cage. They're not out in the light of day, in natural sunlight, pecking in the grass. The eggs that they lay do not have the same nutrition, uh, you know, makeup as pasture raised. And so these are very nutritious and they're very tasty. And you know, for a small dog, you could do a half an egg uh, a day or every other day. For a large dog, they could have an egg a day or every other day, however you want to do that. Raw or cooked? Great question. They could either. Um, you know, most people would say raw is better because the less cooked, the better. Uh, but that's not as tasty. Mm. So a lot of dogs are the smell is delicious. Yeah, a lot of dogs are totally happy to eat a raw egg. Um, and honestly, I don't worry about salmonella or anything like that. And and the free range or pasture raised eggs, by the way, will have by orders of magnitude less chance of having salmonella than caged eggs. By the way, so not an issue there. But cooked eggs may be a little tastier for a lot of dogs, and so I like to recommend soft boiled, mm -hmm. you know, or over easy, or something where it's not so heavily cooked. Hard boiled is not gonna be quite as nutritious, and it's harder to digest for us too. Mm -hmm. So it's actually better to eat eggs that are a little less cooked than a hard boiled egg. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Wow, Dr. King, you are a wealth of information. It is Thank so much you. fun to hear and learn about this, as we said, you know, not only for our dog's health, but of ours, and, and these are all superfoods for all of us. And it's fun to even bring them into our own life and then share a little bit with our dog too. And that helps even at a kind of food energy level, helps us to connect and deepen that human canine bond. So even food can be, as, as it is for humans, a bonding experience for us yes. and our dogs. Exactly. Thank yeah. you for, yes. for you know, verbalizing that because it is so important and, and I see that regularly. Mm -hmm. So. So we obviously have more to share. So for anyone that wants to join us, we are having a webinar coming up. So it'll be on October 24th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. I'll post information for that below um, the Facebook Live that we're doing now, and I'll definitely be sharing it out and reminding everyone, including it in the newsletter. Um, one thing I did want to mention, a few of you had said, how, um, how do I obtain some of these products? Because I don't have a 
pet food store, local pet food store near me, I will put the links for as many as I can. Um, pretty much all of them, you know, some of this is just from your local grocer, your Whole Foods or uh, Trader Joe's is a great place to get the sardines, by the way. Um, but the other items like the Answers and Solely Raw, I'll put links to those companies and they do online sales yep. as well. Yep, and there's also Urban Wolf and Maxoda mm -hmm. and some other ones too that we yeah, can put up that I just didn't have here today. References, yeah. that's perfect. Great. Okay, well thank you all so much for tuning in with us. I know there's a few unanswered questions that we um, haven't gotten to yet, but we will go back in and, and take a little time to answer your questions and thank you for your love and care of your dogs and, and the beings around you. And thank you, Dr. Kangas, for all of your service and love and friendship and commitment. I mean, when we've worked on projects together, some of our dog projects, she is willing to answer me in the middle of the night. She, there's just no end to the willingness that you have to heal animals. And that thank is a beautiful you. Dharma, my friends. Thank, so thank you. you so thank much. You. <laughs> it's my passion to share and I'm eager to help. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Of course. It's wonderful. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye.